Thank you, and welcome to today's uh, installment in the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region brought to you by the National Security Task Force here at the Hoover Institution. I'm Glenn Tiffert, the co-chair of the project on China's global shark power here at the Hoover Institution, and it's my pleasure to bring to you today Dr. Austin Wang. Dr. Wang is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His research focuses on political psychology, public opinion, and the politics of East Asia. His research articles can be found in the Journal of Peace Research, Social Media and Society, Asian Survey, and Political Research Quarterly, among others. And he's the recipient of the Wilson Center 2021 China Fellowship, the Jiang Jingguo Foundation 2020 Scholarship, and the Global Taiwan Institute's 2019 Scholarship. And today he's gonna to talk about the Ukraine crisis and public opinion in Taiwan. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Wang, and over to you. Okay, thank you for having me. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today, uh, I'm honored to be invited by the Hoover Institution and present my observation and research on Taiwan politics. So in recent years, my research mainly focused on how Taiwanese people will respond once China started to invade Taiwan. Well, after all, Taiwan is a democracy. So public opinion matters in Taiwan's foreign policy and national defense. And my recent publication shows that there are some internal and external factors influencing Taiwanese people's willingness to fight. And I will show you these factors later. Well, however, this study was recently we usually criticized by the lack of external validity. Even though all men in Taiwan need to serve in the military for a certain period of time, the majority of Taiwanese people have no experience of war for at least 50 years. So this the ongoing Ukraine crisis serves as a unique opportunity, uh, learning opportunity for Taiwanese people. Because this Ukraine crisis is unique because that is the first time that a social media is widely used on the battleground. So Taiwanese people, they have a first-hand or second-hand information directly from the battleground. So they can use their bare eye to see what the modern world really looks like and they can update their willingness to fight and their other attitude on foreign policy based on what they saw. So some of them could be information, while others could be propaganda. Okay. So today I'm going to cover a series of topics listed here. So first, we were going to explore whether Taiwanese people really received the information or they really noticed that the ongoing Ukraine crisis. Because following the information processing theory, if Taiwanese people did not notice the Ukraine crisis, we cannot attribute to the change of public opinion to, uh, to the Ukraine crisis. And after that, we're going to focus on two issues. The first is that whether Taiwanese people, after they witness what is happening in Ukraine, they change their belief that the US will come and help Taiwan. Because previous studies already shows that Taiwanese people believe that the US will come or not, serious influence Taiwanese, Taiwanese people's attitude on other foreign policy. And the second, we will focus on whether Taiwanese people, they change their willingness to fight after they witness what happened in Ukraine. And beyond that, I'm going to introduce several internal and external factors influence the Taiwanese people's willingness to fight, including the action taken by the US, including our military training in Taiwan. And also in the end, I will talk about the inter internationalization of the Taiwan Strait. I will focus on how, how the public opinion around the world they see the, the they see the Taiwan China relationship, and I will provide some policy implication to the public from the public opinion around the world. Okay, so first, the Taiwanese people really care about what is happening in Ukraine. So my basic answer is yes. So in so here it is a data about from the Google trend uh, in Taiwan in this year. So throughout the year, Taiwan was loomed by the COVID nineteen, like many countries around the world. So Taiwanese people, they search about the vaccine, which is the yellow line, as well as the rapid test, which is a red line on Google. But when the Russia started to invade Ukraine, as you can see, the, uh, the red line on the, on the slide, the majority of Taiwanese people, they start to search Ukraine on Google. And the amount of search is even more than the, the amount of vaccine and amount of rapid test in 2022. So in other words, Taiwanese people, they indeed pay attention to what has happened in the Ukraine. And I can also provide an anecdote evidence on how much Taiwanese people care about the Ukraine. So it is a screenshot from a YouTube channel, which is a very fam fam famous talk show in Taiwan, which is called the Guanjian Shiko. 
This talk show covers a variety of different topics. Some are, politi some are politics, some are international relations, and some are conspiracy, conspiracy theory, and some other are even about alien. So they will upload different clips based on the topic. And I took this screenshot uh, last week, and it shows that whenever this talk show talk about the Ukraine crisis, the view count of these kind of clips is 10 times more than all other clips, uh, including the domestic politics and including some political scandals in Taiwan. And this channel had three, 3 million followers on YouTube, so which is a very influential channel. So I think that it can serve as another evidence that, yeah, until nowadays, many Taiwanese people, they still care about what is happening in Ukraine. And it's even more than the domestic politics. Okay. So now we know that, yeah, indeed, many Taiwanese people, they care about what is happening in the Ukraine. And some of them might follow the information directly from the battleground. Then the next question becomes whether this Ukraine crisis influenced the public opinion in Taiwan. So the first issue we're going to talk about is that whether it influenced Taiwanese people's belief that the U.S. will send troops to help Taiwan. We know that uh, in the past, we found a very strong correlation between Taiwanese people's attitude, our independence, and their belief that the U.S. will send troops and help. But during the Ukraine crisis, we, we also noticed that the U.S. did not send troops directly to, or at least not openly, to the, to, to the Ukraine. Instead, the Ukraine offered some, uh, uh, instead, the United States offered uh, provide weapons as well as some financial aid or as well as some training to the Ukraine people. So whether it will change Taiwanese people's belief that the U.S. will come. So it's our first topic. And the second, I will focus on whether it influenced Taiwanese people's willingness to fight after they witnessed what really happened on the battleground of the modern world. So to analyze these two issues, I rely on two surveys decided by INDSR and was conducted by the National Zhengzhou University. And both surveys were, the first survey was conducted in September 2021. And the second survey was conducted 10 days after the Ukraine crisis, which is on early March. So uh, across, the, uh, across the two surveys, there is no change in social demographic variables. And there is no change in partisanship. And both surveys were conducted through a telephone. So we believe that both surveys are quite representative to the public opinion in Taiwan. So in the first question, we asked Taiwanese people that if, the, if the, there's a core strike war began, do you think the U.S. will send troops to help Taiwan? And in September 2021, 56% of Taiwanese people, they say yes. They basically, they believe that U.S. will send troops to help Taiwan. However, 10 days after the Ukraine crisis, the percentage dropped to 38%. So you, there's a 20% drop, and the drop is, that is uh, definitely significant. Well, however, if we look at what is happening in the distribution, we can find something interesting. So I analyzed that, well, among different subgroups in Taiwan, which group dropped their trust to the United States? And my basic finding is that everyone, yeah, so all group in Taiwan, no matter their partisanship, no matter their national identity, no matter your, their genders or education, everyone dropped their trust to the United States. However, the drop is a little bit more salient among people with a higher education compared to those uh, with a lower, a lower level of, of education in Taiwan. So it could be an indicator of information processing. So maybe people with higher education, they consume more information in the battleground compared to those people with lower level of education. So the next question becomes, once Taiwanese people, they notice that uh, maybe the U.S. will not send true, whether it influenced their willingness to fight. Right. So across the two survey, we asked Taiwanese people that if the PRC really invade Taiwan by force, are you willing to fight to defend Taiwan? Right. So it's because this survey is a close-end survey, and uh, as you can see, there is already some moral judgment behind the survey. So we believe that this survey could a little bit overestimate the overall willingness to fight. But anyway, if we compare the two waves of survey, you can see that even though in the previous question, Taiwanese people dropped their trust to the United States, but their willingness to fight did not change across the two surveys. In September 2021, 75% said yes, they're willing to fight. In March 2022, 10 days after the Ukraine crisis, about 74% they still say yes. And the difference is not statistically significant. Yeah. And but what is more what is more interesting is that when Taiwanese people start to witness what happened in Ukraine 
actually what we find is a trend of polarization. So if we compare it to, to survey, after the Ukraine crisis, there are more Taiwanese respondents that say positive, positive two or negative two, which means that some of them are even more willing to fight, while others are even more choose they don't want to fight anymore. And this polarization trend is statistically significant. And after that, I further analyzed that who changed their opinion, who become more willing to fight, and who become less willing to fight. And I found this trend of polarization is, is, is basically driven by partisanship and by the gender. Uh, in, in, in Taiwan, among those DPP supporters, after they witnessed the Ukraine crisis, they increased their willingness to fight. But among KMT supporters and among nonpartisan, they they, their willingness to fight declines statistically, uh, and the decline is statistically significant. And I also found a similar trend on gender. So after the Ukraine crisis, uh, male respondents in Taiwan, they are, much, they are more, willing, more willing to fight, while the female respondents, they are less willing to fight. And basically, the uh, the change in gender is similar to uh, to the literature, is similar to other cases around the world. But the change, along with the partisanship, I think it could be related to the information or related to the channel of information consumption, which is maybe particularly biased. Okay. So basically, the two direct impact from the Ukraine crisis to the public opinion in Taiwan is that the first, Taiwanese people decline their belief that the U.S. will come. And, but at the same time, Taiwanese people polarized on their willingness to fight, along with the partisanship and the gender. So after that, I'm going to share with you some indirect impact from the Ukraine crisis, including the action taken by the United States and also the action taken by the Taiwan government. So the first is that, uh, as I just mentioned, after the Ukraine crisis, Taiwanese people, they would believe that the U.S. will come, drop about 20 percent. But if we keep tracing the trend of public opinion, we notice that in recent months, the Taiwanese people believe that the U.S. will come regain back to 50 percent. And especially in the most recent survey conducted by NDSR, which was conducted right after Pelosi's visit, uh, once again, about 50 percent of Taiwanese people now they believe that the U.S. will send troops to help Taiwan. So why is it the case? So to to analyze the cultural mechanism behind the change of public opinion, I conducted a natural experimental analysis on another survey conducted by INDSR in last June. So in June 2021, when the INDSR was collecting the data in Taiwan, uh, the Senator Doug Worth visited Taiwan unexpectedly. So because of this, I can compare the public opinion in Taiwan right before and right after Senator Doug Worth's visit. And I noticed that there's there is a, a statistically significant effect on Dark World visit. After the senator visited Taiwan, Taiwanese people believe in their own national security, believe in their own military, and believe in the U.S. all increase within 24 hours. So I believe that a Pelosi visit could have a similar cultural mechanism, which drive the Taiwanese people to believe that the U.S. will send troops to help de defend Taiwan. So it could be the reason why we see that in August 2022, there are about half of Taiwanese people, they regain their belief that the U.S. will send troops and help defend Taiwan. So the first, the action taken by the U.S. matters. Okay. The second is about the military training. So we know that the Taiwan government just announced that last week that it is, they are discussing about whether to extend the military training in Taiwan back to, back to one year, because currently the mail in Taiwan need to uh, we need to be trained in the military for about four months. And Taiwan government are discussing whether to extend this military training back to one year. However, in the article that I just published early this year, I noticed that the relation between the military training itself and their willingness to fight is actually not a linear. To be specific, I want to highlight that the effectiveness of the military training matter. So in this online survey I conducted right before the 2020 presidential election, we notice that if Taiwanese respondent they experience the military training, which is effective, which means that they believe they learn some technique or knowledge that can be useful on a better ground, then these people they will have a higher level of willingness to fight. In comparison, if many Taiwanese respondent they think what they learn in the military training is useless, then they will actually have a lower willingness to fight. 
So it means that even though Taiwan government extend their military training back to one year, if 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 those if if Taiwanese people they only all, all they did in the in the in the military camp is to just clean the camp or just to paint the floor, then actually it will have a negative impact on Taiwanese people's willingness to fight. So the effectiveness of the training also matters. And the third factor I want to highlight, or also, also the last factor I want to highlight, is about the collective action. So actually, I in a series of survey experiments, I noticed that Taiwanese people's willingness to fight is actually like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So in this survey experiments, I asked some Taiwanese respondent that, well, if all other Taiwanese people will not fight, whether you still want to fight. And for other Taiwanese respondents, I tell them that if all others are willing to fight, whether you want to fight or not, right? And I found this treatment to be very effective. If Taiwanese people, they notice that others will not fight, then they will also choose not to fight. But at the same time, if Taiwanese people, they, know they are informed that all others will fight, then they also choose to fight, right? So, so it has several uh, important implications in the study of the willingness to fight among Taiwanese people. The first is that, well, basically, if the China government can successfully persuade many Taiwanese people that others will not fight through propaganda, then in the end, it will be true. Everyone will choose not to fight. But at the same time, if Taiwanese government can successfully mobilize people to make everyone believe everyone will fight, then in the end, it will come true. Right? So it also indicates that, well, it could be meaningless trying to find a precise est estimation on the willingness to fight among Taiwanese people, because that the level of willingness to fight is all about collective action. It's all about the persuasion and mobilization. Okay, so after we talk about some internal and external factors um, in Taiwan on their willingness to fight, I want to highlight some public opinion around the world. Because we know that during the Ukraine crisis, one important intervention is that there are many countries choose to sanction Russia economically. Right. So this sanction also influenced the calculations in Beijing. So we are wondering that, well, if the China started to invade Taiwan, whether the China will face a similar sanction like the Russia received in recent year. Right. So to to uh, in recent month. Okay. So to explore these issues, I analyzed a survey conducted by Democracy Perception Index. So this survey, they, they, it was conducted in 53 countries, and it is an online survey, and it was conducted right after the Ukraine crisis. So in this survey, the survey asks people around the world that, do you, are you, do you support your country to sanction Russia economically? And do you, uh, or do you support your country to sanction China economically once China starts to invade Taiwan? Okay. And here is a result. Here's a country level result. So basically, across all countries, if, the, if people in a country have a higher level of tendency to agree to sanction Russia, then the same country also have a higher level of tendency to sanction China. And the Pearson's R in the country level is 0.9, which is very strongly correlated. And in further analysis, I, I noticed that through regression analysis, I show that, well, if a country, for those countries who have a higher tendency to sanction to sanction China. The people in that country also have a higher tendency to have a negative attitude toward China. So, so a country's ten willingness to sanction China strongly relates to their attitude toward China. But at the same time, a country's willingness to sanction China weakly relates to the attitude toward the United States. So, in other words, if a China keeps spreading a negative image to the world, then peoples in many countries would increase their likelihood to agree to sanction China. And similarly, if a U.S. can bring its passive image to the world, then there will also be more countries are willing to sanction China because of the U.S. passive image. However, if we look at different each country differently, we can notice that well, the, uh, the, this issue is much more complex because for, any, for many countries, uh, the attitude toward the U.S. and attitude toward the China is not a single dimension. Mm -hmm. So here is a distribution for people's attitude toward the United States and people's attitude toward the China across the 53 countries. So many, for many countries in the West Europe or for the United States or for the U.S. alien in East Asia, indeed, they, they see the attitude toward the China and the U.S. a single dimension. 
they either love China and hate the U.S. or they love the U.S. and hate China. So if, as you can see, which is on the uh, uh, button right corners or an upper left corner. But for many other countries, they don't see the necessity to choose a side. They hold a positive attitude toward China and the United, United States at the same time. So all of these countries appear on the uh, upper right corner. So for these countries, if the U.S. and Taiwan want to mobilize this country to, to, to corner the China, then it needs additional strategy and additional if effort trying to persuade people in this country that why it is necessary for, to choose a side between the China and the United States. Okay. So overall, I also provide some internal and external factor on Taiwanese people willingness to fight, and I talk about internationalization of the Taiwan Strait. So basically, it is all I can cover today. Today, I talk about whether Taiwanese people care about the Ukraine crisis and some factor, direct influence of the Ukraine crisis to the public opinion in Taiwan. And in the end, I talk about some factor regarding the U.S. regarding the Taiwanese people willingness to fight, as well as internationalization of the Taiwan Strait. So that's all I can share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who want to ask questions that are here live in the audience, I ask that you just raise your uh, tent card and I'll take your names in order. And uh, for those of you in the uh, Zoom audience, you can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So I want to take the moderator's prerogative to ask a question. Um, one of your findings, Dr. Wang, is that um, opinion about whether the uh, Taiwanese people would fight appears extremely volatile. It responds almost in real time to, to events. And it's also extremely fragile. That's the collective action problem. And so I wonder if you can extrapolate any policy prescriptions from that with regard to preparing for an eventual conflict, uh, if there is one between Taiwan and China. Um, what, in a perfect world, um, would you like to see then to ensure that the outcome is desirable? <laughs> Uh, I think it's a very good question. So actually, just like I mentioned at the beginning, it's extremely hard to study this topic, the willingness to fight, right? So I think we can draw the comparison between the, the, our, the result I found in Taiwan compared to the result that in the previous survey in Ukraine. So basically, the World Federal Survey had ever conducted the survey in Taiwan and Ukraine together. And in the World Federal Survey, it also asked people in Ukraine and Taiwan that once your country was invaded, are willing to defend your own country. And in the, in the World Federal Survey, I think in the last two waves, in Ukraine, about 70% say yes. And it's, in Taiwan, it's also about 70% of, of the respondents say yes. And we already noticed that what happened after Ukraine was invaded, right? So I think, so, and many people in Ukraine, they are willing to fight during this, uh, during this Ukraine crisis. So, so I think it provides a little some external validity that maybe when Taiwanese people, they are answering the questions on the willing to fight. At least uh, a, a considerable proportion of them are telling the truth. And so I think that's my uh, first response to whether this kind of survey they are really reliable or not. Yeah, and regarding your regarding regarding your second question, I think it is. I think it's also related to what what I talk about about the, the collective action. I think that. Nowadays, when China decides to start to influence the public opinion, to influence the public opinion in Taiwan, they not only use a military threat, they also use their soft power, trying to influence the Taiwanese public opinion in a very local level. Right. So I think that one important uh, strategy for Taiwan government can apply is that it needs to enhance the media literacy among Taiwanese people. When Taiwanese people they they got information, they need to double check where the information is from and whether the information source is, is reliable or not. I think it's quite important, especially we notice that uh, after, right after the process visit, uh, the China started several internet attacks toward Taiwanese government or toward the banners or they hacked several of the banners in Taiwan. So you can imagine that if they use a similar strategy right before or, or right after the, the, the China's invasion to Taiwan, it will cause a huge impact. So I think the Taiwanese government need to do more, trying to enhance the media literacy among Taiwanese people to make them understand what kind of information is at least reliable. So whether Taiwanese people uh, think of the of the U.S. invasion will, will seriously influence by the outcome of the Ukraine-Russia uh, crisis, uh, because most of the survey I present today only rely on the, the survey data which was conducted right after the Ukraine crisis or in this August. And we know that now, nowadays that the situation in Ukraine changed rapidly. So I can 
imagine that if the Ukraine really prevail and win at the end, I think it could encourage Taiwanese people a lot, I, I can say, because currently there is a, uh, many Taiwanese people, they believe that there is no chance to win the battle against China on their own. And even though uh, the U.S. and many uh, generals in Taiwan, they, now they, they suggest a policy like the to prepare for the uh, asymmetric war or or net or increase the national defense. Still, many Taiwanese people think that it's not it's, it's impossible to win the war against China on their own. And so, if the Ukraine can, really, can successfully defend the invasion of, of 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 Russia, I think it could be a very encouraging to many Taiwanese people. Yeah. Well, I want to take a question that's coming from the Zoom audience, and I, I wonder if you have any data that could help guide an answer towards this. And that is, do you sense that the Taiwanese people are satisfied with the level of support that the U.S. and its allies are providing Ukraine? Do they expect that the U.S. and its allies should do more for Ukraine? Maybe what lessons are they drawing from that? Well, uh, at least in the survey, I haven't found any survey asking Taiwanese people that whether they are satisfied with the amount of help from the U.S. to Ukraine. I didn't see any survey like that. Right. Yeah, but I think that since, uh, because at the beginning of the Ukraine crisis, many Taiwanese people, they believe, and some of them even received the propaganda that the Kiev had already been occupied by the Russia. And in the end, it did not come true. So I think that the, the current... Uh, better conditions in in Ukraine had already surprised many Taiwanese people. So I mean, many Taiwanese people, they believe that they can, the Ukraine can, can resist the invasion of Russia. So far, it's because they help from the United States. So I think since the, U, since the Ukraine had had not been, been fully defeated right now, so I think it could be still be a very encouraging story to many Taiwanese people. Thank you. Jim. Hey, thanks, Glenn. Hey, thanks for coming out. I appreciate the, the talk and, and the insights. Uh, you mentioned that the, the two political visits seem to have at least some kind of influence on the trust level in the Taiwanese people that, mm. that we would get involved. I was wondering if you've seen other things or have a sense for what specific activities that we could continue to do that would bolster that trust more and which types of activities may, may fall flat so we can kind of focus some, some, some policy recommendations on, on what we could do to improve that. Well, actually, uh, I think it's a very good question because uh, uh, as I just show, at least statistically significant, we can find that there are some uh, when 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 there's a U.S. high-level visit to Taiwan, it can increase uh, Taiwanese people believe that they're on their own national security and they believe in their military and they also believe in the United, United States. However, if we do this analysis a little bit further, we, we we can also notice that the effect will fade quite rapidly. So after one week or after two weeks, this this effect might fade because among many Taiwanese people, they still think that. Yeah, the U.S. high-level visit is good, and it can boost maybe the approval rate for the current government a little bit. However, if there is no uh, actual cooperation between the U.S. and, and Taiwan, then Taiwanese people will think that this high-level visit only benefits the, the incumbent party's own reputation, but not more. So in the eye of many Taiwanese people, they are still waiting for just like more economic cooperations or the joint or joint drill between the U.S. and Taiwan, Taiwan troop. I think at least there is something that the Taiwanese people, they want to see that the U.S. and Taiwan have more cooperation uh, uh, above the table, I think could be further evidence to make Taiwanese people believe that indeed the U.S. and Taiwan have, have a stronger relationship than before. So if I could I summarize just to make sure I, I'm getting your point, it's sustained visibility on, on these things, not just flash in the pan type, type events. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. So I want to build on that, actually, a uh, question from the audience again, uh, on the Zoom audience. Uh, they want to go back to your slides and the findings that say that although the, the belief in the U.S. coming to help sending troops dropped, for example, by 18 percent um, immediately after the war, the willingness to fight did not drop so significantly. And so the questioner asks if it's your conclusion that the two are not linear, are not related linearly, or maybe they're decoupled, or maybe there's a threshold relationship. How do you interpret those results? Yeah, actually, this result is quite interesting because in the past or across most of the study, including my own publication, we always find a very strong correlation between the belief that U.S. will come and Taiwanese people's own willingness to fight because it's based on some rational calculation. Taiwanese people believe that if the U.S. send their troops to Taiwan, then they have a higher, have a higher chance to win. If there's a higher chance to win, then I'm likely to to, to join the fight, right? But but I think so. So that because of this. So the result in, in this march is so interesting. That's the reason why I choose to share it here. It's because that there seems to be a, this connection between Taiwanese people's willingness to fight and the, 
and, and they believe that the U.S. will come. I think we can see this change in the correlation, partly because of the Ukraine crisis. And because in the Ukraine crisis, the U.S. did not send a troop to Ukraine, at least not publicly. But still, the U.S. provide a different kind of help to the Ukraine, so help Ukraine to resist. So in the end, the result so far is not that bad. So I think it changed how Taiwanese people, as well as a world, as well as a world, to imagine what the world will be in the modern world. Thank you. Please, Corey. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you for your comments. Can I go back a little bit? <clears throat> excuse me to the next step of of Jimmy's question, which is, um, I understand your your research shows that uh, through our regular visits, we generate. Taiwanese willingness to fight. Mm -hmm. One could also argue it creates antagonism and creates an environment where uh, you may have to fight, right? So mm -hmm. less visits don't generate as much Taiwanese will to fight, but they might also generate less uh, events of war. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So uh, if I was, if you were advising a you know a policy team on this scale. Uh, what what do we do? More more visits may lead to more fighting. It it, it is contrary to our own stance historically as the U.S. Mm -hmm. a little bit. Do you understand the question? Yeah, I understand the question. Yeah, so basically, if I am going to make a policy suggestion, I will I would argue I I would recommend that we we have to strike a balance between the corporations in military and corporation in in economy. Right. So so sometimes when when we see the high level visit, we should not only emphasize the part on the military, just like the joint drill thing. Sometimes we also also emphasize the importance, just like the economic corporations or or the or more corporations in the in the civic level in the in the civic level, not just always about the military. I think there will be a battle, so we have to strike a balance between different issues on U.S. Taiwan cooperation. That's a very timely answer in light of the announcements today that there's movement towards a trade agreement with Taiwan, uh, at least uh, some minimum ground. So, David, please. Thank you for being here, Dr. Wong. I'd like to ask, um, and maybe this is a, this is drawn more from your subjective uh, observations of Taiwanese media, but uh, how is Taiwanese media portraying U.S. involvement in the war in Ukraine? Is Are they focusing more on what the U.S. is doing or what the U.S. is not doing? Well, actually, the, my first answer is that the the, pub, uh, the public uh, the, the mass media in Taiwan is highly polarized. So I so I can just tell you the the narrative from the both sides. Right. So among those uh, pan China news media in Taiwan, basically they will portray that the the Ukraine crisis is mainly driven by the United States. They argue that well because because the, the Ukraine was encouraged by the U.S. to join NATO. So because of this, that Russia, they need, they cannot help, but need to defend themselves. Yeah, so, they, so they argue that Ukraine crisis is, on, is only caused by the United States, and the U.S. can benefit from the Ukraine crisis. So there's a narrative that is mainly used by many uh, pro-China news media in Taiwan. And just like I mentioned, on the first day of the Ukraine crisis, in many uh, pan-China line group, I can find, they already got they they already received the propaganda from China that the Kiev had already been occupied by by the Russia. Yeah, so it's quite common. It's, it's on the first day of the Ukraine crisis. But among those uh, anti-China uh, mass uh, news media in Taiwan, they mainly argue that the U.S. provide different kind of, of defense weapon to to the Ukraine, and Ukraine defeat Russia from time to times, and the Ukraine is seems seems to successfully uh, reclaim all of its territory or things like that. So the narrative from the both sides are. Very different, <laughs> if I can say. I think it is part of the reason why we can see the polarization in the Taiwanese people willing to fight along with the partisan line. Thank you for coming, Dr. Wong. This is fascinating stuff. If I could go back to what you were saying about military training and effectiveness, you talked a little bit about things that really decrease willingness to fight, sort of ineffective military training, scut work, painting floors, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So if you could make a policy recommendation and speak to what would be most effective, particularly as the Taiwanese government right now is trying to reshape how they think about training? Well, I think uh, one policy suggestion I would like to make is that at least the most Taiwanese people who's, who are trained in the military, they need to know some knowledge about a defense weapon, at, or, or at least they need to know some defense strategy that is being already used in the Ukraine crisis nowadays. Because based on, based on my personal knowledge, the military training in Taiwan, they are still very traditional. They still believe in that we need a large, uh, we need a large, large group of, 
a large group of, of soldiers who, who fight face to face or things like that. So which is very outdated. So I think one part of the suggestion I would like to make is just to make the advanced or updated knowledge into the military training. So I'd like to pose a question from Matt Turpin in our Zoom audience who points out, you know, I, I want to refer back to the slide where you referenced um, Senator Duckworth's arrival in Taiwan and the impact that that might have had on public opinion. He asks a somewhat related question, which is, do you have any data or any inference you can draw on how the Taiwanese public responded when it became public that U.S. special forces were training on Taiwan with their Taiwanese counterparts? And how would you expect the, the public discovery of those exercises and that training to affect public opinion? Well, what I can say is that because that news is not widely co covered in Taiwan. So most of Taiwanese people, they may not perceive that there's a joint training between the U.S. and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because I, I also remember that last month there is another news saying that, well, there's a new apartment being built in the Penghu Island, which provides a U.S. soldier to to be trained in Penghu. And yeah, it should be a big news to Taiwanese people. But actually, the majority of Taiwanese people, they did not notice that there's a such a news. But so the, this the news, this situation is quite different from uh, from a, a, a dark world visit in Taiwan in June 2021, because that on June 2021, Taiwanese people, they are waiting for the, they were waiting for the vaccine. And suddenly the, the, the dark world, uh, Senator Dark World and two other senators, they choose to bring vaccine and visit Taiwan unexpectedly. So all major news media, they cover this visit and they, they cover the, the speech from the from Senator Dark World. So at the same time, the INDSR was conducting a survey. So I can use this to find a strong and significant effect on the, the senator's visit. Right. Matthew, please. Hi again, uh, thanks for being here and for uh, taking all the questions. Uh, mine's uh, kind of goes back to your comment on the the training aspect mm -hmm. uh, in your research and in the study that you looked at. Is there anything specific that you saw drew more attention uh, in the media outlets or in the media area? Like, if there's an area to focus, like a specific type of training or involvement um, from the U.S. The, you, you mentioned the apartment building didn't get a lot of news, and maybe it should have. Mm -hmm. Uh, have you seen any other kind of interaction that has uh, gained a lot of interest uh, or response? Well, unfortunately, I have to say so far, I did not find any news that draw the, draw the attention by the majority of Taiwanese people because currently Taiwanese people, they are still focusing on other issues just like economy and COVID-19. But I can see that our the, the current president, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, should actively promote the coverage of the military. So according to one of my surveys, I uh, of my study to analyze uh, President Tsai's Facebook. I noticed that she will post something about the military at least once a week. And usually when she posts something about, about the military, that post will receive more likes compared to other posts of, uh, other posts just about other policy or other faces. So I can, I can say that well, President Tsai should try hard to promote the image of the military, but yeah, but, but, but so far, because, because it is still far away from people's daily life, so it did not draw too much attention from the Chinese public. Thank you. So I wonder if I can wander a little bit from, from this topic to other work that you've written on. Um, in particular, you've written a piece that argues that strategic ambiguity should be dropped. Mm -hmm. And I suggest that you know, this is perhaps relevant to the topic that we're talking about today, that is, you know, Taiwanese people's willingness to fight and resist. What do you think um, the strategic ambiguity, strategic clarity debate, how is that playing in Taiwan and how does that affect the question of the Taiwanese public's willingness to fight and resist or not? Yeah, so I think it's a very good question. So, so basically the article that I wrote about strategic ambiguity is that I suggest that currently uh, the strategic, strategic ambiguity and another term which I call is about dual, uh, dual clarity. They are not very different from each other. So, so I mean the dual clarity, it means that, well, if, so strategic ambiguity means the U.S. never, never reveal its own its true position. The U.S. never promised to help Taiwan and U.S. never promised not to help Taiwan, right? And in the, on the opposite, the dual clarity means that the U.S. openly say that it is going to help Taiwan, but with a with a prerequisition that if Taiwan did not declare independence, so which means that if the U.S. openly claim that well, if Taiwan maintains the status quo, the U.S. will protect Taiwan, then I call this as a dual clarity. So I also conduct a, a series of different survey experiments showing that if the U.S. makes such a promise in dual clarity. 
then actually Taiwanese people will also lower their willingness to seek independence. So it can also maintain the status quo. So the effect is similar to strategic ambiguity when the US never make any promise to either the China or Taiwan. So that's my main finding from a survey experiment. So, so I did not claim that the US should give up strategic ambiguity. So in that article only claim that the room for the US to maintain strategic ambiguity will become smaller and smaller because the nationalism is, in, is rising in Taiwan and nationalism is rising in China. And also according to a recent survey by the CSIS, most, almost 100% of the experts in the United States, they believe that China, when China is calculating its, its war against Taiwan, China already assumed that the US will, will, will intervene, right? Since the, so the US believe that China believe the US will intervene. So there's no, not such so much difference between ambiguity or not ambiguity. So that's my perspective. So if I understand you correctly, one of the arguments that's often made in the strategic clarity debate is that it would be dangerous for the United States to demonstrate strategic clarity, even if it also demonstratively had the capability to realize it, because that would embolden the Taiwanese to seek independence. And you're suggesting that that's not true based on your survey data, that in fact, it would reduce the risk of them taking a reckless maneuver for example, in provoking the PRC by moving further towards independence? Uh, yeah, because uh, one assumption that the strategic ambiguity always holds is about, is, is about the principal agent problem. Right? So in the past, we believe that there's a moral hazard issue among Taiwanese people that if the U.S. promise to defend Taiwan, then the Taiwan will start to seek independence. And if Taiwan starts to seek independence, then it will make China angry. So China will attack Taiwan. So the U.S. need to involve. Right? So that is what we assume about the strategic ambiguity, right? But in my study, I shows that if the US declared that they are going to defend Taiwan, only if Taiwan chose not to independent. And I asked Taiwanese people that under this scenario, do you still seek independence? And my final result is, is actually the opposite. Taiwanese people will say, okay, then let's just keep the status quo and let's choose not to be, in, not to be independent. So this is my main finding from the survey experiment. So I did not find in empirical data about the moral hazard. So if even the US promised, if U.S. put this prerequisite in at the beginning, then the Taiwanese people will choose not to change the status quo. Uh, I want to draw on a question from the audience again um, in Zoom land. Um, whether it's your data or other data, I wonder if you can point us to any insights on whether the Pelosi visit affected Taiwanese public opinion, and in particular, the Chinese military exercises that immediately followed the Pelosi visit. Did that, did that change the willingness to fight or the perception of the United States um, willingness to aid Taiwan. Do you have any indications? Um, because I think this is relevant for uh, how whatever message China was trying to send was actually received. Well, actually, I think that we can uh, analyze the Pelosi's visit in two aspects. The first is aspect is just like what I presented. It actually, after the, the Pelosi's visit, we can see that Taiwanese people start to believe that the U.S. is going to uh, send troops to help defend Taiwan. But at, at, at the same time, I, if you look at uh, some other survey, which is not academic survey, we can see that uh, some Taiwanese people, they lower their trust to the Taiwan president Tsai Ing-wen in, in, in her management of the, of the cross right relationship. Because in the past few years, there's a very interesting phenomenon that the majority of Taiwanese people, they, they approve the, the Tsai Ing-wen's policy on, US, uh, on the cross right relationship. But after the Pelosi's visit, we can see that the percentage declined a little bit, which is now is a little bit below the 50%. So some people, they think that because, because the Pelosi's visit, some, pe some people in Taiwan, they start to think that the, US, the person side did not, hand, did not handle the, the cross-trade relationship that well compared to maybe last year or two years ago. I see. So we have a very important um, set of local elections coming up in Taiwan that in, in some sense could also decide the future of the presidential election a couple of years later. Um, I was wondering if you have any insight on the extent to which the survey data that you're talking about today will weigh on those elections or whether they will be decided purely on local issues. To what extent uh, is the future of Taiwan, the Ukraine crisis, whether the U.S. would assist in, in, in defending Taiwan, uh, an election issue for this current election? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. So basically, what I found, especially in many surveys in Taiwan in recent years, is that uh, after the Ukraine crisis or a little bit before the Ukraine crisis, 
we can see a trend that the majority of Taiwanese people, now they choose to be nonpartisan, which is a new phenomenon that we haven't seen before. Because in the past, at least 60% 60, 60 of Taiwanese people would identify themselves as either pan blue or pan green. But at the beginning of this year, now more Taiwanese, uh, at least more than 50% of Taiwanese people, they choose to be nonpartisan. So we can also see a similar trend in the Europe or, or also in the, in the United States. And this trend is unique is because that uh, in the past, we believe that the, the cross right relationship is the only important issues among Taiwanese people. But now many Taiwanese people, they start to think that maybe the future of Taiwan will be decided by the US and the China instead of Taiwanese people of their own. So they become less interested in the politics or they are less interested in the cross right relationship. So they don't want to identify themselves as to be either a pen blue or, or pen green. They only want to be nonpartisans. So uh, based on the studies in political science, we know that when Taiwanese people choose to, when people choose to be nonpartisan, then the information they consume will be different from those information consumed by, by people with partisanship. So I think that one, uh, one uh, phenomenon we've already seen is the referendum last year. In, uh, at the end of last year, there was a referendum in Taiwan, and, and the turnout rate in Ta for that, that referendum is really low. And based on, many of, based on my, my study, I show that I noticed that the referendum is mainly driven by the KMT supporters and DPP supporters. Most of the nonpartisans in Taiwan, they chose to be abstain in that very important referendum in, in 2021. So I think that since the majority of Taiwanese people choose to be nonpartisans now, so it, will, so it also means that their turnout rate could be, a, a, be even lower in this upcoming local election. So I can imagine that this local election, even though there are survey data shows that, well, maybe the KMT or DPP, they have leading in some district. I believe the result in this local election will be mainly driven by the turnout rate. And especially many people in Taiwan, they start to lose their interest in the politics. So I believe that it could be. So the, the, the party mobilization would matter even more in this local election. Right. So thank you very much. Um, what about the battle to succeed, Tsai Ing-wen? Um, to what extent is uh, U.S. support one way or the other uh, and the sense to, of public opinion on whether the U.S. would, would aid Taiwan relevant to the succession of Tsai Ing-wen? Well, I think that uh, basically, for the first I want to say is that the election result in the upcoming local election might not relate too much to the upcoming presidential election. It is what I can say, because we already witnessed what has happened in 2016. In 2016, the, the DPP was defeated totally in the local election, but the Tsai still got reelected in 2020, right? So, so, I, so it's the first issue. And the second issue I want to say is that, well, many Taiwanese people, they still believe in Tsai. So the Tsai's approval rate was, was still about 40%. Which is not low compared to, to the two previous pre president, Ma ying or Chen shui -bian. Yeah, but at the same time, I can see that many Taiwanese people they start to they gradually lose their patience on the many promises that President Tsai had already made. Yeah, especially for the enhancing the uh, the economic cooperation between the U.S. and Taiwan. For example, in the last referendum in twenty in in the twenty twenty one re referendum, uh, the majority of Taiwanese people they did not ban the US the, the, the import of the US pork. Yeah, but but during, during during the campaign, the DPP supporters they argue that uh, well this referendum is related to the future the economic cooperation between the US and Taiwan. But after this referendum did not pass, so far we did not see too much advance on the economic cooperation between the US and Taiwan. So many Taiwanese people they started wondering whether the Thai can really deliver its, its promise. On the, uh, on the economic cooperation between the US and Taiwan or Taiwan with other countries. Right. I, I invite others if they have questions to ask, but you know, so much of the discussion today has been obviously about, about the Taiwan-US relationship, but there's much more to Taiwan's defense and Taiwan's security than just its relationship with the United States. For example, there's Taiwan's relationship with Japan. I'm wondering if you can uh, point us to any survey data or results that would indicate um, how the Taiwanese public perceives itself within the region and its friends and allies and partners there. Um, irrespective of just the United States, because I think U.S. strategy also, if we were to defend Taiwan in the event of a crisis, would also lean very heavily on participation from Japan, uh, and that would be pivotal. So look beyond just the United States, and let's examine perhaps Taiwanese attitudes towards its regional partners as well. 
Well, according to many surveys that we can see, the Japan remains to be Taiwan's most preferred country. So if we ask Taiwan to to give the, the score from 0 to 10 to all of the country nearby, the Japan always received the highest score, which is even higher than the United States, China, or South Korea. But I didn't see too many surveys. Actually, Taiwanese people believe that whether the Japan will help defend Taiwan or not, because I think uh, many Taiwanese people, they still believe that the Japan's action will actually uh, lead by the United States. So, so, we, so Taiwanese people, they still think that US, United States is a, is a, is a pivotal player in, in, in the cross strike. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I'm wondering if you have surveyed data about attitudes in Taiwan toward Admiral Li Shi Min's overall defense concept. Mm -hmm. Is that if, is that a subject of public opinion surveys? Are people in Taiwan gravitating toward the idea of um, investing, I don't want to use the word asymmetric, my colleague Jim Ellis keeps <laughs> stressing to us that it's too frequently misinterpreted and misused, but toward the idea of a distributed defense with lots of small lethal mobile things perhaps not to the exclusion of big weapons, bigger, uh, uh, heavier weapons, but at least with a substantial investment. Uh, one, we have gotten the sense that there's been a lot of resistance to the overall defense concept over the years in the professional military, but that maybe things are changing in the government. Are they changing in public opinion? Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, at least in the surveys I read in Taiwan, I did not find any survey really asked that question about uh, Li Minxi's uh, strategy directly. So that's what I can answer. But I know that in the past few years, there are several surveys asked Chinese people that whether do you support the idea to extend the, the military training back to one year. And all of the survey received the majority of support, about 70%, 80% of Taiwanese people, they support such an idea. But you can say that this idea is partly driven by the fact that many Taiwanese people, they will say yes, because I will not serve in the military anymore because I already, already retired. So only the young generation need to serve in the military. But even among the young generation, I still find, uh, at least in the survey, even though there are not many young people in the survey, uh, a considerable proportion of young people that also support this idea. But as I just met, mentioned in my presentation, it still depends on the quality of the, of, the, of, 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 of a military training. It's not just about extending the, the, the military training on its own. And, and also I have to say that when we ask about Taiwanese people's attitude toward this kind of military strategy, usually it will serious, be serious influence on the, the, the alternative, what the alternative would look like. For example, I know that the Duke University, which where I graduated, had conducted a series of surveys in the past 20 years. It asked Taiwanese people that, do you, there are two options. The first is that, do you support to buy more missiles from the United States? And the second option is that, do you support some other moderate approach? So the, so the question wording is just more moderate approach. Then, so it's such a two option question. Most of Taiwanese people will choose the moderate approach, even though they have no idea what the moderate approach is really is. But if we just ask people that, do you agree with the idea that we should purchase more weapons from the United States directly? So if we just ask this question directly, the mo most of people will say yes. So I think that framing plays a lot of very important factors in public opinions on the, in Taiwan in their attitude toward the military training. So it all depends on what kind of, of alternative it could be in the survey. I wonder if you could reflect, because some of your data suggests uh, volatility and the fact that Taiwanese public opinion is highly responsive to current events. Um, the Taiwanese public opinion reaction to the statements of currently serving and recently serving U.S. Uh, uh, officials, for example, Secretary Pompeo, uh, he left office and went to Taiwan and suggested that Taiwan should declare independence. You know, he's not just an ordinary uh, American citizen. He's a former Secretary of State. Uh, he spoke in a much more direct way than, than most serving officials do, and certainly than, than Speaker Pelosi. And similarly, President Biden has four times indicated that there's more clarity than ambiguity, and then his administration has walked those statements back. And so what effect does that have on public opinion? How is that interpreted? Well, basically, based on um, 
most of the academic academia uh, academic survey in Taiwan in the past 20 years, basically Taiwanese people they still hold a conditional preference in the independence unification issue, which means that we ask Taiwanese people that if you if China will not in, invade Taiwan, whether you want independence, then more than 80 percent of, of Taiwanese people people will say yes. And this uh, ratio is quite consistent in the past 20 years. So the majority of, of Taiwanese people they agree that once the China will not invade Taiwan, I mean, most of the Taiwanese people will say they want independence. But when we ask Taiwanese people that if China will invade Taiwan, whether you still support independence, then the level of support for independence will drop 50% to only 20%. Yeah. Yeah, so it means that most of the Taiwanese people, they are quite practical. They understand that the reason that Taiwan chose not to be independent or Taiwan chose to be status quo is mainly because China never gave us its military threat at our Taiwan. I think there are many reasons why the Taiwan still keep its status quo. So, I, so, but there's one trend we can find is that the percentage of Taiwanese people who think they should seek independence, even though the, US, the China will attack Taiwan, this percentage will gradually increase in the past 20 years. So 20 years ago, the percentage is about 20%, but nowadays it's closer, it's, it is closer to 30% to even 35% in a recent survey. So it did not reach the majority, but it is still an, a concerning trend we can find so far. So let me turn back to President Biden's remarks, though, because you could read it in one, any of two ways. For example, it might bolster confidence that the U.S. would intervene because the president himself indicated that the U.S. you know, had Taiwan's back in a way. Or you could say the fact that his officials then walk that claim back could shake your confidence in the fact that the United States um, would help Taiwan. Uh, how do you? What do you think is the dominant reading in Taiwan of these four episodes? Well, currently I have to say that even though the Biden promised to defend Taiwan, but in the eye of the majority of Taiwanese people, they at least they don't want to be the troublemaker. They don't want to move. They don't want to move first to change the status quo so far. I think it is part. part it is uh, this psychological mechanism can partly explain the. The result of the 2018 referendum, because in 2018, there's a referendum asking Taiwanese people that whether we should apply to use a land Taiwan in the future Olympic again or not. And in the end, it, it was opposed by the majority of Taiwanese people. So I think it indicates the fact that many Taiwanese people, they still, even though in their heart they want to be independent, if China will not attack Taiwan in the future, but so far they still want to maintain the status quo. All right. Dr. Wan, I'm curious if you've had the opportunity or uh, you, yourself or if you've if you've come across any other survey data from 2014 that may have asked a similar question to the Taiwanese people, mm -hmm. you know, when Ukraine, the crisis really arguably started with the annexation of Crimea, <clears throat> excuse me, and if those responses are any different than today's given a different U.S. response. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it would be a very interesting topic, but I didn't notice that there are any survey cover these issues in 2014. Yeah, but I will try to look at that. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that brings us to time. I'd like to thank our participants very much and the audience uh, uh, coming, visiting us virtually for excellent questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang, for your wonderful surveys, your results, and uh, your answers to our questions. Thank you for having me.